from security. Distracted by the fine things in life. Is there anywhere you feel safer or more protected than your own home? Particularly when you're surrounded by loving family and friends. In 2012, a Scottish village was devastated by the death of one of their own. Murder, that's... Everyone shivers at that word. It's such a haunting word. Losing someone like that, it was earth-shattering. You'd put the telly on it and there's Jenny's face. That's how. This was a community where everyone knows, looks out, and cares for each other. But what happens when one of the very people you rely on turns out to be a cold-blooded killer? Fertivia is a little village about eight miles from Perth. Perthshire generally is low crime. Uh, I would have to say most of the crime that does occur in Perthshire is in Perth itself. For Fertivia, everybody knows everybody. Crime extremely unusual. I struggle to think of a single call to Fertivia prior to this murder being committed. Jenny's life revolved around her husband, her son, her dogs, um, her cat, Rambo. A pillar of the community, 80-year-old Jenny Mevin was a churchgoer, a staunch supporter of the Red Cross, and was also president of the local Women's Rural Institute. Jenny just helped everybody. Jenny was extremely popular. You'll never get anybody to say a bad word about Jenny. Margaret was Jenny's secretary for a while at the Rural Institute, and the pair became firm friends. Because Jenny and I were both widows, we were our own support system at night. Jenny was a very outgoing person, extremely outgoing. Margaret regularly visited Jenny with her granddaughter, Susan, who also felt she was part of the family. Jenny, she was very much like another grandparent to me. Um, you could trust her with anything. For her age, extremely fit, would walk and think nothing of walking four to five miles a day with her dog. She was always on the go. What she could do at her age would knock a lot of us to shame. If you're ever having a bad day, she'd know how to make you laugh with something. She'd come away with some funny stories. She was very loyal and um, loving. She would never badmouth anyone. I never heard her say a bad word about anyone when I was growing up. Jenny's husband died in 2006. But before then, they had been a very strong family group. Jenny's husband was Andrew, known as Drew, loveliest wee man. They'd had a very, very happy marriage. The couple had a son, David. Jenny and David had an extremely close relationship, so alike. Bounced off each other, same sense of humour, same temperament. So there could be, you know, your arguments as well, as sons and do mothers do but no, very protective of each other, and Jenny just absolutely worshipped them. Once Drew died, David and Jenny, they became closer. David ran and owned a very successful building contracting business in the Perthshire area. 
but stayed with his mother to look after her. David is very, very private. Loyal, big, big animal lover. He's exceptionally busy, never takes a day off, never has a holiday. But no, very, very private. Despite David being well off, for the next six years, he and his mother lived a very simple life. They kept themselves to themselves. But David did let somebody get close. David and Willie had been friends about 20 odd years. Kind of best as friends, you know. Willie and his wife cut the grass. We saw Willie a couple of times a week. And Jenny spoke of Willie. She'd said it was a friend of David's. A 20-year friendship suggests bonds of trust that have been established, tested and reinforced. And if you like, that length of a friendship is almost longer lasting than many marriages. So clearly there were pillars of trust established. So William would have been welcomed into the mother-son dynamic, almost like an extended family member. He would have been part of their inner circle and would have known a lot about them. So it would have felt, perhaps to the three of them, very safe. I'd known him for a long time and Davy thought he was an extremely close friend. Well, he knew everything. At the beginning of 2012, a shadow fell over the village of Forteviat. Local journalist Gordon Curry covered the story. There had been a number of reports of high-value uh, housebreakings, which looked very much like um, targeted sort of professional jobs. It very much looked like it may have been the same gang who were carrying these out. Obviously, this kind of thing would raise a lot of eyebrows locally. On the 20th of February 2012, between five, six o'clock at night, I was notified that a, a female, an elderly female's body had been uh, found in, at premises in the Fertivia area. And there appeared to be some injuries on the victim's body, but no further details were available. You knew something bad had happened because it is such a small villages and the amount of police cars. When David Mevan got home that Monday, he was met by a sight that would change his world forever. I subsequently learned that it was the victim, Jenny Methan, her son, David Methan, found the body when he returned home that evening. Just sirens upon sirens upon sirens and we knew the road had been blocked off. Very surreal. Never seen so many police in my life. That day is actually quite a bit of a blur. In the quiet rural village of Forteviat, a spate of burglaries already had the residents on edge. When on Monday, the 20th of February, 2012, David Mevan had found his mother dead in their home. For somebody to leave his house, to leave his mum in the morning, go to your work and come back, and I think they were anticipating going out for a meal that night, to come back and, and be faced with what he saw when he walked into the house, must have been devastating for the man, absolutely devastating. Quite brutal injuries uh, had been inflicted on the poor woman, causing her death. It was clear from Jenny's injuries that her attacker had intended to kill her. Police were now treating her death as murder. The first time I've been back here since that late night, early morning. The house is directly through the trees there. When I arrived here, the police presence was quite significant. There were several uniformed police officers here who'd put a cordon round the entire property so there was nobody getting in or getting out of that crime scene without their details being noted. 
With such a serious crime, a team was quickly put together. Divisional Superintendent Jim Leslie was brought onto the case. This was a massive investigation right from the start. It involved every force in Scotland, number of forces in England. At its peak, we had 150 officers involved in it. 80-year-old Jenny Mevan had been declared dead at the scene. Catherine Kirkwood was in charge of the forensic team. The lead biologist on the case was tasked to go out and carry out a forensic recovery of the body alongside a pathologist and other police staff standing on step plates to avoid dislodging any potential footwear marks. The key here is preservation of all evidence types, anything alien to the scene that might give an indication of who has been there. When David found his mum, she was on the floor wearing a jumper, trousers. I think one of her shoes had come off when she was still on and she had socks on. There was a lot of uh, blood in that area of the body and in the general area of the kitchen where swings had been inflicted and probably blood on the weapon. Notably, when he arrived, her face had been covered with some cloth or sheet. Obviously, David had to remove that and saw the images of his mum underneath the sheet. On the Monday night, I hadn't been able to get hold of her, and I'd phoned and I'd phoned and I'd phoned. The following day, I tried phoning, still nothing. Because Jenny inevitably phoned me at half past eight in the mornings. Nothing. So I tried phoning David, and couldn't get him. And then my pal across the road, I stay in the village further up, that something had happened at Jenny and David's. They weren't sure what it was. There was a lot of blue lights going. Well, I just went to pieces. And next thing, the whole village got descended on by the press. The first time we heard about the case was a phone call which I received to tell me that there was a large police presence in Fortiviate Village, um, which obviously suggested that something pretty serious had happened. Pretty quickly it became clear that a murder inquiry was going to get underway. That's how we found out that Jenny... It was really, really hard. Because even the following day, nobody would say that she'd actually been murdered. The post-mortem showed that Jenny died as a result of blunt force trauma, having been hit on the head at least 11 times. The injuries were such that it fractured her skull from the back to the front and there was a fragment of bone um, inside her brain. In addition to that, the poor woman had obviously put up some form of defence because both her forearms were also broken in a defensive manner, as if she'd, she'd raised them to try and, and stop the blows coming down on her. So she had suffered a terrible end to her life. I think I went into a kind of shock system too for quite a while. You put the telly on it and there's Jenny's face. That's hard. You're in this situation that you've never been in in your life before and you really don't know how to handle it. When it happened, I was 10. I was 10 years old. I felt like my whole life had changed and just something had shattered completely and I didn't because I was so young I didn't know how to handle how I felt so I was just very quiet and cried a lot but felt like nothing was the same losing someone like that it was earth shattering I think I would have been easier to deal with if it was natural, old age, or an illness. But because it was murder, that's... Everyone shivers at that word. It's such a haunting word. 
David Mevin does not wish to talk directly about what happened that day, or since, but wants his mother's story to be told. Davy had to put Jenny's body down and try CPR. You know, when she'd been dead for, I mean, that's pretty horrific. Davy has never spoken about that. For TV, it was now the unlikely setting for a real-life murder mystery. So this is for TV. And about a mile, maybe less, from where Jenny Methan was murdered. Particularly where you have such a brutal crime being committed um, on your doorstep, had a massive impact on the local community. Everybody was looking over their shoulder, Jenny was particularly well known, even by the bus drivers for walking her dogs. Just this total disbelief that anything like that could happen here. There was concerns that it may have been in some way related to these previous housebreakings which had been going on in the area. So clearly they were looking at the possibility of robbery gone wrong. People were obviously concerned that whoever had carried it out was still at large. I hate the thought of anyone breaking into my home to steal, but the idea that those same people could be willing to kill is terrifying. Could those responsible for the local burglaries also be Jenny's killers? It shocked everyone. Everyone was locking doors more than ever before, because where we stay, there's really no need for that. Nothing ever happened, ever does happen now, but to this day, people are still locking doors more than they used to and more wary if they see someone in a field walking, whereas before, no one really batted an eyelid if a man or a woman was walking across a field, whereas now, people take second looks about it. David was the first person to find Jenny dead when they returned around about quarter past five that afternoon. So we set to work to try and narrow down those time frames to try and pinpoint when the murder took place. When there is a murder, the first suspect usually is. Somebody close. Really didn't see much of David the first few days. I think he went on to autopilot. Wouldn't really have known what was happening. We'd looked at David and his background, as long as his mother's background, to see is there anything there that, that could have uh, contributed or, or been a catalyst for this, this crime of violence. And there was nothing there. With no evidence connecting son David to his mother's murder, he was quickly ruled out as a suspect, and a killer remained at large. We started to investigate Jenny's last movements. She had missed a doctor's appointment on the afternoon of the killing, suggesting that possibly she was already dead at that time. We also managed to trace uh, an old friend of hers who had been on the phone to her in the morning. It looks like the last communication finished around about half past 10. And Jenny finished the call to say she heard a vehicle coming into her driveway. So that was the last contact she had. Police believe it's likely Jenny heard her murderer driving. So officers scoured footage from traffic cameras, cataloguing vehicles on the roads near her home at the time. We had daily press releases because we wanted to trace vehicles that had been captured in CCTV, so we released images of those vehicles to the press and the drivers of the vehicles, most of them, came forward, identified themselves and were eliminated from the investigation. As other routes reached dead ends, police hoped the forensic evidence they were collecting would shed some light on the killer's identity. In this case, we could establish from the blood patterns that Mrs. Methvin had been seated when blows were struck in the area of the kitchen. We were now thinking 
more and more that this might have been a murder committed by somebody actually known to Jerry. Her family, her friends and associates, what did they know? Could there be anything in Jenny's background that resulted in this murder? The police hunting for the killer of Jenny Mevan had ruled out her son David as a suspect, but had very little more to go on. One of the significant findings in the case was a finger mark which had been left in blood on a telephone in the kitchen. The blood matched Mrs. Methven, which was not surprising. The fact that the finger mark was made in blood was significant because it must have happened at the time when Jenny's blood was still wet. Therefore, if the attack had been premeditated, there hadn't been thought given to wearing gloves. In looking at the blood spatter, we also made an assessment of how likely it would be that the perpetrator would have blood transferred onto their own clothing as a result of the attack. The fingerprint didn't match anybody already on the police's database. There was no obvious candidate for having carried out this crime. So clearly people were thinking, you know, was it somebody within the community? Was it a gang had been robbing houses? We had discovered within the house a large sum of money. Our investigations had shown David's wealth. Might this have been a motivation for the crime? I knew what Jenny was like with money. Banks? No, she didn't trust them. From what I know, a lot of the money was Jenny's and they could account for it. The money was still there, of course, which did suggest that potentially this had not been a robbery gone wrong, but this was potentially somebody who had knowledge of Jenny. The forensic team had also found traces of DNA at the crime scene and on Jenny's body that didn't belong to her. So we looked to eliminate people who may have had access to the house. 40 odd close friends, associates, family, volunteered to give DNA and fingerprints for elimination purposes. None of them were a match to the murderer. Very often when you have a murder, you've already got a good suspect, a good idea of motive, a good idea of who might have carried out. In this case, we did not have that. We had not recovered the murder weapon, you're looking for an early breakthrough. But very often you just have to be patient and wait for that moment. Jenny was a much loved member of her community with no known enemies, so who would want her dead? Well, inquiries were leading nowhere and the police desperately needed something to go their way. William Keane was a close friend of David Methan. He's been described as almost being like a brother to David Methan and had a similar, very, very close relationship with, with Jenny Methan. About a month into the investigation, uh, he made an attempt to take his own life, taking some tablets and cutting his neck. The police investigation discovered a suicide note, although Willie had survived. The suicide note said that he was killing himself because he was scared he was going to get the blame for Jenny's murder, although he didn't do it. Now all police attention zeroed in on Keane, who had known David for over 20 years and often did odd jobs for him and Jenny. This was a big moment because Willie was already involved in the inquiry. He had already been interviewed and had obviously been at the house before. We identified that the car that he tried to commit suicide in had been picked up by CCTV in the area on the day of the crime, and also we were able to tie his phone into that area. So this was the big moment, the moment when we really thought we have a, we have a good suspect now. Could this old family friend really be the person who mindlessly bludgeoned Jenny to death? Ultimately, Keane ended up in Murray Royal Hospital. 
a secure mental institution in Perth, where he was for some time. Legally, the police were not allowed to interview Keane while he was being treated at a mental health facility. But they were allowed to search his home. A significant recovery was made in the garage of his home address, where a pair of trousers, blood-stained trousers, were recovered. There had apparently been an attempt to clean these using bleach. One of the pockets had had the bottom cut off, we believed, to allow a hammer to be concealed down the leg of the trousers, a hammer being a likely murder weapon. When William Keane recovered enough to be released from hospital, he was arrested. Gutted. David was absolutely gutted. Couldn't believe it. Absolutely shocked. David, he's trying to process the murder of his mother. And that's a massive traumatic scar right there. Then his best friend, attempt suicide and in the suicide note says something about I I didn't do anything this must have been at some level hugely disorientating for David because he may not know what to think William Keane was detained suspected of murder and taken to Perth police station where biometric details were taken from him fingerprints DNA it was noted that he made efforts to frustrate that somewhat by um, self-inflicted injuries to the tips of his fingers and the palms of his hand that would stop fingerprints being taken. However, prints were obtained, DNA was obtained, and we got a match to the items discovered in Jenny's house. Keane's prints were all over the murder scene. His was the bloody finger mark left on Jenny's phone. Forensic examination of the recovered trousers showed DNA for William Keane as being the wearer of those trousers. And from blood that was recovered on them, the DNA of Jenny Methan. In times of crisis, we all turn to our mates. And since the death of his mother, David had relied on William Keane. Now he was facing the horror that his close friend was the man responsible. Sickened. Absolutely sickened that it was somebody so close to him that had done it. Even up until Willie was charged, Davy was still meeting up with him and having a coffee. It's horrendous that his mother, but then to discover that it's your so called best friend or one of your best friends that's done it. You know, this person consoling you or whatever and then discover that it's them. So it was a double blow. It must have been very difficult for David to process that this murder, violent murder, was committed by somebody very close to him and his mother because you have to almost rewrite history and say, did I miss something? Have I been duped? You know, he's lost his mother to a violent death and now he's lost his best friend. And now he's also lost his history with that best friend. And looking forward, he's got no one. So what a terrible place for David to find himself in. If things weren't bad enough for David, Keane was refusing to admit anything. When he was asked if he'd been at the house that day, he said, no comment. He did say, I never murdered Jenny. It was pointed out to him that his phone was in the area, and again, his reply was, no comment. When he was asked how he would react if he was told that his DNA had been found on Jenny's arm, he said, I'd be gobsmacked. He just was not um, participating positively in the interview process. Just over a month after her death, police officially charged William Keane with Jenny Mevin's murder. There was a genuine sense of relief that they'd got somebody. This community didn't know him. He's not from here. Nobody here would have known Willie Keane. 
The news of William's arrest was met by disbelief that it was somebody known both to Jenny and to David and liked by them, trusted by them. He wasn't a violent man. He wasn't a man given to dishonesty or criminal behaviour. He appeared to have a solid marriage. He, he had a son and um, it's just very hard to understand how you go from, from being this to being a, you know, a savage, brutal murderer. Jenny's body had been found with a cloth over her head. Detectives felt that this was more than just a random act. There's a school of thought, and I've experienced it in a small amount of murders, where if you get a party who is closely associated with the victim, um, it's not unusual to cover the, the victim's face if you're still in that area, so you don't have to see them, to stop you looking at the person you've killed because you're that close to them. She never deserved that. No one does. She was a lovely person. And everyone has their own stipulation on why he did it. The only conclusions I can come to is jealousy of what David had. Money is the obvious thing, although it was never really clear. Uh, William may have had financial problems, um, but certainly not to the point um, where, you know, he would have been expected to carry out this kind of act. And there was money in the house that wasn't taken, which would suggest that that wasn't the motive. With Keane charged and in custody, David could finally lay his mother to rest. It was a private funeral. Davy and I had gone through who would be there. And it was by invitation only. And the bit that shocked me was the media up a tree. That was bad. On the 7th of August, 2012, Keane went on trial for the murder of Jenny Mevin. He was still insisting he was not the killer. Not only that, in court, he made shocking accusations as to who was ultimately responsible for Jenny's death. At the High Court in Glasgow, he entered a not guilty plea and uh, had a special defence of incrimination, uh, blaming David for the murder or people that David knew had carried out the murder. He tried to say that Davy had done this, he'd done that, he was a uh, money launderer, drugs and all that. He tried to blame David, that it wasn't him, it was David. Standing trial for the murder of Jenny Mevin, William Keane stunned everybody by incriminating her son David. At the trial, Keane claimed that he had turned up at the house to pick up a couple of tires and some paperwork that David had left. When there'd been no answer at the door, he had gone into the house and there he had found Jenny lying, dying on the floor. He had asked her what happened and she had said, David. David. He was obviously asked why he hadn't called 999, and his response was that he was worried about being blamed for the killing. He said that he had been told by David that David knew who had done it. It was his druggy friends, and that if Keane told, he could arrange to have him done in. Keane also claims that David offered him £30,000 a year for three years to keep quiet. So a very aggressive defense towards David. Now, David Mevin found his private life being raked over in the cruelest way, at the cruelest time. You'd see the headline of drug dealer or money launderer. The vast majority of the locals never believed the headlines. A lot of them found them ridiculous and funny. I think further afield, I mean, I think, I think they were damaging. I think people always think no smoke without fire. Our local park got spray painted 
that Davy had done this and Davy was a drug dealer, Davy was a money launderer. That's sick. After everything he'd been through, his mum was murdered and someone does that. He was left with nothing. His whole life had been there in the court. He was left with no privacy. There wasn't one vestige of Davy's life that they hadn't gone into. Yeah, and that must have been horrendous. David was called on to give evidence in court and answer Keane's accusations. The thing that stood out to me was David's reaction to it. The way he conducted himself. He portrayed himself with real dignity during a very, very difficult time. There is a real selfishness here about what William did anyway, in that David has to stand up in court and defend himself and say he's innocent of the murder of his mother. Emotionally, he would have had to push to one side his own grieving process to defend himself, which means that grief process is delayed while he stands up in court facing the murderer saying, I didn't do it. How many things would David have had going through his mind just to deal with just standing there that day must have been horrific. Keane's version of events began to unravel in court. His evidence was all over the place. It seemed to change from minute to minute. At one point, he, he, he looked at the jury and said uh, that he didn't have a bad bone in his body. There was a really strong case against Keane with excellent forensics. Thankfully, on this occasion, uh, the jury did their job. They weren't distracted and they came to the right verdict. After a 10-day trial, William Keane was found guilty of the murder of Jenny Mevin. He was sentenced to life in prison, with the recommendation he serves a minimum of 22 years. It was amazing. Usually, you're found guilty and then you come back a couple of weeks later for sentencing. You get sentenced there and then. And that was pretty unprecedented. That was amazing. That was amazing that day. David came out after the trial too upset to speak himself, but he had the police read a statement on his behalf. Billy Keane was a friend of mine for more than 20 years. In fact, we were almost like brothers. I cannot begin to understand or forgive what he did to my mum. It was an act of betrayal and his denials in the time since, and particularly during this trial, leave him beneath contempt. The thing about betrayal in this instance is it's very deliberate. So this person had a choice about whether they killed Jenny. They had a choice about whether they lied about it and they chose each time to do the wrong thing. That is a roller coaster of emotions that David would be on with his supposed best friend. And I think it would leave a very long traumatic scar. Can he ever trust anybody again? If the family and friends of Jenny Mevan thought the guilty verdict was the end of the story, they were wrong. William Keane, after he was found guilty, uh, continued to protest his innocence. He launched a number of appeals, I think four in total. All appeals were ultimately rejected and he remains in prison serving life for the 22 year minimum period. In a surprise move, David Mevan then launched a civil action against William Keane. He wanted acceptance that, that William had been responsible for his mother's murder. So he sued him for £160,000. And when William eventually backed down and um, gave up fighting it, um, he was effectively accepting blame for, for the crime. Private prosecution was the only way that David was able to get Willie Keane to admit that he was guilty. He won his case and was awarded, um, I think, around £86,000, which he said he would donate to animal charities that his mother had supported throughout her life and had worked for and volunteered for. Keane was still insisting he was not the killer. 
Many years have passed since Jenny died, but the memory of her murder has stayed with all involved. Today was the first time I was back at the house where the murder took place, and this is the first time I've been to the graveside where Jenny's buried. It reinforces to me this shattering event for the family, for the close friends and the community in general will never heal for some people. And that's a fact of life. It will never go away. It's baffled me, to be honest. Most murders are very straightforward and you know who's done what to whom and why they've done it. But this one, it still remains a bit of a mystery on why William Keane murdered Jenny Methvin. You know, Jenny and I could speak for an hour, if no longer, at night. Night on every night God sent. Um, I miss her. It was always kind of, it was really nice to always hear her voice. In the time since his mother's death, David has done his best to move on. David's very seldom actually said anything about it. That's how private he is. I think it's made him a wee bit harder. He's got a good enough sense of humour, but he's more guarded now. There's no way I don't think he would ever trust anybody again the way he did with Willie Keane. It makes you question your own friendships, you know. Just leaves you hmm, pretty down for a long time. But Jenny would be angry if she knew I was sitting crying. <laughs> but... It was a frenzied, vicious attack on an innocent, defenceless old lady by someone who she trusted and treated like family. No warnings and no clear motive. Begs the question, who can you really trust?